All right. Okay. So let me introduce my guest for today's podcast. His name is Richard Sellis, and he describes himself as a honest pirate, helping content creators attract their tribe with their vibe. He is a former social media video content editor at CNE Media and owner of a video graphica, a broadcast media company. Actually, he is working with a lot of different things, and he currently has going on going on a community of C- which he calls Creosphere. Sorry if I pronounce that wrong. Uh, where he teaches creative strategists how to do creative strategy by doing it. Hope I got that right. Welcome, Richard. Yeah, sounds great to me. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Oh, thank and you for having me. Yeah, after a lot, lot of time because we tried a lot to get on the this call and hopefully we, we made it possible. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, sometimes life gets in the way and yeah. gotta rearrange schedules. But we're here now. Definitely. So I will jump directly into the questions. Like uh, absolutely. How would you define content strategy? How would I define content strategy? Well, you know, essentially what a content strategy is, it is a documented plan mm-hmm. which is going to give you a roadmap for all your marketing endeavors using content that have very specific goals attached to them. So it's a very intentional plan for your content to achieve business goals. Mm -hmm. That sounds interesting. So uh, let's suppose we are in the process of building a brand. And Mm -hmm. uh, where do you think the content strategy fits in? Like, does it fit after a brand strategy? Or should you do this before brand strategy or with the brand strategy? Or should you do this after you have done brand identity and you know who your target audience is? like after all that stuff is done. So where do you think content strategy fits in? Well, it's an interesting question there. Um, me personally, I believe content strategy happens after a brand strategy mm-hmm. for several reasons. Um, one, you got to understand who, who you are first in order to communicate your vision to the world or your values to the world or your purpose to the world. And in addition, there are some elements of a brand strategy and content strategy that synergize. For instance, both require you to know your ideal audience Mm -hmm. because in my opinion, brand strategy is very internal first while content strategy is very external because you're focusing on the audience. Yeah. And once you have your audience in mind, you can easily do your content strategy, but you also have to understand who you are first. Otherwise, all the content you put out there might not necessarily represent what it is you are or what it is you want to portray about yourself and you're focusing only on your audience. Therefore, after your brand strategy is done, it will definitely make your content strategy much easier. If you do your content strategy first, it can be done. It's just you might not be getting the results that you want as fast or even getting undesired results that aren't necessarily Mm -hmm. resonating with your business goals. Yeah. And uh, like in the brand strategy, we try to like pull out uh, authentic stuff from the brand. Like what's your real story? So we may ask questions like, uh, like this, I would like to term it like we are a brand therapist and we're trying to figure out what your story is. So how big is the part of the content strategy? Like how much their story matters? So in the content strategy, it's not so much about your story mm-hmm. as it is about your audience's story. Okay. Because as I mentioned, content is very external focused because you really have to know the lives of your ideal audience, really understand their pains, their desires, and you're going to talk to those and the stories that you're going to use in your content to resonate with the audience because you're going to make your stories as relatable to your audience as possible Therefore, they're going to stay watching, consuming your content. And then within that content is your messages about your services or maybe messages about your own personality Mm -hmm. and making yourself relatable to the audience so they can connect and see themselves in your stories. But ultimately, in the end, all your content should be focused on your audience. And if you're going to be doing anything personal about yourself, you have to make yourself relatable in order for your audience to connect with you. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. yeah, you were saying something. Sorry if I interrupted. Oh, it's just, yeah, just kind of reiterating the, port, uh, the point that brand is internal primarily and then content is external primarily. Okay. So let's suppose uh, 
as you are saying the content strategy is about the audience and getting into their shoes and telling story mm -hmm. from their point of view yep. so let's suppose we are working with a new brand who's just starting out and they're trying to figure out like dipping their toes in different field of trying to figure out who their tribe is like what mm -hmm. you say like who's their tribe is so how can they bring out their stories like for most of the brands they do not have any customer testimonials and stuff like that so what's mm -hmm. the content strategy for them okay i want to make sure i understand your question correctly sure, sure. um this is a new brand mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have a well defined audience yet they're, they're yeah. just they're basically playing the field to figure out who their audience is mm -hmm. if i understood you and in that situation that they don't have a clearly defined audience it's very hard to have a content strategy because your almost your entire strategy is going to be built on your audience profile and understanding the, the customer journey or audience journey and if that's not there that's the foundation of a content strategy so therefore your all your content at that point is really just throwing things at the wall to see what sticks so mm -hmm. in the beginning it's very experimental yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that because if you don't know your audience, that's okay. I would highly suggest just throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks, what resonates with people for maybe at least 30 days at minimum, and mm -hmm. then go back and review and do an audit and figure out which pieces of content are working and reverse engineer and understand why it's working and who mm -hmm. it's working for, and then double down on that and understand those people and start talking to them and that can become your audience. Then you start getting more intentional and structured with a strategy for your content because now you have some insights into this audience and you understand them better you understand why they want this type of content what is working for them what isn't working for them because ultimately that's the foundation of your content therefore if you're a new brand you don't know your audience i would more focus on your internal and focus on yourself and your knowledge and share that with people but you got to find it in a way that has your own personal touch to it Mm -hmm. Because I've noticed, especially now with just the proliferation, the massive amounts of brand strategists out there now, yeah. everyone's kind of telling you the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And it's, it's like if you're not telling anything new and you're repeating the same type of information someone else is already doing, what must be done is if you're going to communicate that same message or same golden nugget that's been everywhere already, Put a twist on it. Put your own personal twist on it. Make it personal to you that people can relate to. Therefore, mm -hmm. it makes the content more valuable because it now has this, your own personal touch to it that is relatable to you. And ideally, people will resonate with you more so than the information that's already been regurgitated multiple times. Therefore, yeah. experiment, experiment, experiment in the beginning if mm -hmm. you don't know your audience. And then based on that, review your content, analyze it, really, really take a deep, hard look at it and understand who's watching it and why they're watching it. And then from that information, you can start building your content strategy. Yeah, I think yeah, that should be the most actionable step. Like you throw everything out there and figure out if I'm getting this right from your answer that you, you have to experiment a lot. And then, so that's the part there, like... Uh, when I'm working with certain brands, let's say they are a tech startup mm -hmm. and they want to appeal to a massive audience, like they want to sell their products to everyone. So that's the case there. Even if they niche down, they do not want to off offend anyone. Uh, without disclosing any name, this is what I heard from like CMO of that brand. Like we mm -hmm. want to include everyone. We are not discriminatory. We do not discriminate with anyone. And whatever trend is going on in the world, we are with it. We are not against the wind. So. How do you think this uh, like corporate theme, like we have to please everyone works with the content strategy? Let me ask, is that business, is that business successful? They are just trying out. I'm not sure <laughs> that how long they will be successful. <laughs> so th this is very typical. Um, I'm surprised the CMO says that because they should know better. Mm -hmm. Most companies just want to make money. And I find this a lot in brands or companies that don't have a well-defined purpose or brand strategy because if they did, they would be principle and value driven and they would be more focused on the type of content or even the audience that they're trying to serve. These, it sounds to me for this particular company, they're just like, hey, we're open for business. We can help you. We'll take anybody. 
Yeah. Uh, that's, it sounds like, oh yeah, we don't want to exclude anyone because we want to make as much money as we can. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because when you say, hey, I'm for everybody, everyone's like, well, who cares? You're, means you're just generic and how are you going to help me specifically? Because I'm looking for something very specific for someone very specific who understands me to help solve my problem. And it appears to me, you just help anybody off the street. So why would I want to go to you? Like, mm -hmm. you're not talking to me. I'm looking for this person over here who's speaking my language while you're just talking generic. Therefore, when people niche down, you end up targeting a very specific person and talking to them to attract them to get your business started. It doesn't mean you deny other people mm -hmm. your services if they come talking to you because you're still going to accept them. You're just not really positioning and promoting your services to those people. Granted, mm -hmm. when you do niche down to a specific person, there are parallel industries, parallel people next to the one you're targeting. Therefore, you might attract some of them. They'll come to you as well. If you, that's why I think um, most people visualize niching and targeting as a little target, like a bullseye. Yeah. So if you're aiming for that little tiny bullseye as your main target, there's other rings around it. And they're not, you're not going to hit that bullseye every time. You're going to hit those little bull, the other outer rings next to it. And it's fine. Mm -hmm. Those customers are good too. The problem is when you're completely missing the target and you're shooting off to the left, shooting off to the right, and you're just like not even in the same area, that's when you're a problem. Because that's what happens when you're not niching. You're just literally shooting over here, shooting over there, shooting over here, shooting behind me, just throwing stuff up in the air. And maybe it hits the target, maybe it doesn't. There's a great Zig Ziglar quote I like a lot. He says, I'm going to butcher this a bit. So no worries. There's, if you're not aiming at the target, you'll never miss. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Because you have no intention of what you're shooting at. You're just like, mm -hmm. whatever. And when you have that, like, hey, we're going to serve everybody, that comes across to the clients and audience like, hey, whatever, they don't really care. They'll take anybody. So if they don't really care, why should I care about them? Yeah, that's interesting, definitely. Uh, for me, I think that uh, if you want, uh, like, if you want to create your tribe, then you have to take the risk to offend someone. Because Correct. if you are saying anything and you want, you want to try, please everyone, you will not connect directly with anyone. Yep. So, yeah. It, I see it the same as a personal relationship, either mm -hmm. in, in like your friendships or your dating or whatever. You can't go out and be a people pleaser and please everyone, yeah. right? It, it's just not, I don't think it's psychologically possible mm -hmm. because there's people out there you just don't like in general because either the way they think or the way they behave, you're just like, uh, like I might have to be, I might, have to work with them because we're in the same company, but it doesn't mean I have to like you. And vice versa, there's some people you really like, oh, you're so cool, man, I wanna hang out with you. That's the kind, those are your clients that you want. Like they want, they want you to be so cool, like, hey man, you're really cool, I like what you're saying, let's hang out sometime, versus like, oh, this guy's a total douche. Get yeah. out of here, right? And if you're trying to be friends with really cool people and people you just are disgusting. It's like, uh, you're not gonna, everyone in the middle is like, why, why are you doing that? Like, I'm not down with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in the start to, as I was starting as a content creator, my strategy was that I want to create a palatable content, which a wide mm -hmm. range of people can use. And I have seen like, uh, there, there are some interesting creators on various social media platform that they use some strong language. They show their personality through their content. Mm -hmm. Like if someone is very, we can say, doesn't like af afraid of using some strong words, like F words and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it shows authenticity. While there are some people who will create tutorials and content like that, and they mm -hmm. are not able to build a community around that because it, you might have to take the risk to find anyone, but you will attract the people who vibe with you. And that's what I feel. So for the, like uh, a brand who's st just starting out and they do not have, let's say, a big, or they do not yet know that what their main story is, what should do, they should go with. So, is, is how, it, repeat that last, they don't understand, they don't know their what? Their main story, like what they should focus on. Let's say they do ah, brand okay, strategy okay. and mm -hmm. they figure out like, we are like a good content creator. We want to please everyone. Mm -hmm. But how do you pull out that story? Like your X factor, 
so is there any way to pull out their, their x factor their past story because a lot of people do not want to offend anyone so as a brand therapist or a brand strategist we have to figure pull that story out some for me because it get difficult to pull their story out so what's your strategy on that sure um there's a couple of things happening let me see if i unpack it correctly one mm-hmm. was i'm hearing as a new brand they don't want to offend anyone yeah was one and the second part of that was how can they communicate their authenticity through their stories um to answer the first question don't want to offend anyone it sounds to me they're coming from a place of fear when you come from a place of fear and you let fear dictate your decisions that's a bad place to be fear is not a great um is not great for your mind essentially granted humans have survived off fear for i don't know how many millennia it's in our dna to some degree but for me i do my best not to let fear dictate my decisions uh i do what i can to allow positivity and love and what's best for the situation to to decide what my what my choice is and then for the second part of how to find your voice or your authenticity via stories what's worked for me in the past and i, I do this with my clients as well is look to your past mm-hmm. is really look through your life at these keystone moments whether you transformed or an event happened to you and you handled the situation very differently than you normally would or there's these moments in time through your history that were very important to you that you can remember as if they were yesterday those are the stories you want to document write down or if you do like i do i like to dictate because it's faster for me and then i'll have my audio transcribed mm-hmm. therefore i'm able to read it as if i'm reading a book because it allows me to disassociate from my own story as opposed to listening to my own voice because it's kind of weird yeah therefore when i'm able to read it when it's written now i can highlight it i can cross things out i can write notes and annotations and it allows me to really dig deep and analyze these stories as if i'm a third person and find these patterns and connections that like wow this is interesting this happened to me when i was 5 years old this happened to me when i was 10 years old this happened to me when i was 25 years old and there's this common thread through all of them this is fascinating and you'll start seeing all of these golden threads throughout your different stories mm-hmm. and that is you that's your character at your core doesn't matter what age or what circumstance there's these common threads through all your stories and once you find that that's when you become aware and you once you become aware of those things then that's what you're going to use to communicate because that's who you are most of the time us as humans we go about life we don't see these things because it's just who we are we just kind of take it for granted because i am who i am and you are who you are and a lot of us don't take the time to reflect and look on our past let alone read and dictate our own life story back to ourselves because it seems a little awkward and egotistical mm-hmm. but in order to get that new perspective on who you are it has to be done therefore that's what i did and through that i was able to understand myself better and i was able to grow because now i'm more aware of certain character traits or even bad habits that i had mm-hmm. that i'm now working to eliminate therefore when i communicate my messaging and my stories now i have this core element that i inject in every story now because it's the essence of my character and for me it's always been about belonging and connecting with people all my stories through my past with the exception of a few that are just me for me sake but most of them have always been motivated by connecting to other people whether it was through traveling or with a group of friends or doing certain activities ultimately the underlying motivation was always to connect with people and build relationships so that has become a core essence of my purpose now is to always connect people and build relationships therefore yeah. mine your past what worked for me is think about 10 milestone moments in your life depending how old you are like i'm in my mid 40s now so i've got a little more i guess you could say timeline to to mine mm-hmm. and even if you're young if you're in your 20s that's fine even in your teens you have at least a decade worth and over time you'll get more and they will change but the easiest thing to do is think about those ones that you just remember right away like it could be any age is just they have such an emotional attachment because i believe emotions are the glue to memory Mm-hmm. therefore focus on those first and you don't have to write the whole story out just do a headline or a note just describing to trigger the mind like oh yeah that time when you know my fourth birthday and i got whatever and then over time then you start refining it and then you can start mining it 
and you'll find what you need to look for. And that is who you are. That is the core of your authenticity. So let me, uh, let me say, Sorry, that was I, a lot. <laughs> yeah. If I got it right, uh, I'm seeing the certain similarities between what Steve Jobs said about connecting the dots. Hmm. So do you think, how is this is it, it is for oneself to self diagnose or should you hire someone to help you on that? Because I've noticed a lot of creators say that it's, we are our worst client. We cannot operate, do strategy <laughs> on our, ourselves. And I've tried you this can, because it takes a lot of time and you feel like what else I'm missing? Like if, if someone is there and asks you a lot of questions and targeted questions mm -hmm. like you do with any other client, then mm -hmm. you realize, so how difficult it is for oneself to do strategy on oneself. I will speak from experience. Uh -huh. It's extremely hard. Um, I tried it for a year and from my, from what I experienced and what I found out is you can only get so far. There are psychoanalyzing yourself. You have too many biases and blind spots mm -hmm. that either you just don't know exist or you're subconsciously ignoring because you don't want to deal with it. Therefore, I do not recommend self-diagnosing. You can do self-reflection. Yeah. I highly recommend. Self-diagnosing, I do not. Definitely seek an outside perspective because the other person will see things you do not see and they can also act as a mirror where they will project back to you what you said, but because they said it, it makes sense. <laughs> the mind works in mysterious ways because yeah. you can tell yourself all day and never believe yourself, but as soon as you tell it to someone else and they repeat it back to you, it's like, click, oh yeah, I get it now. It's Our minds are, are weird like that. Nonetheless, there's that Melinda Livesley coat. You can only see the label. If when you only see the label from the inside of the bottle, you can't see the outside of it. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. You can look inside yourself, but you're only going to see so much. And then when you have someone from the outside looking at you, they can see these spots that you don't see. And in addition, it's nice to know what... It's a, this is going to be a slippery, slippery slope, but it's nice to know, at least from people you trust, what they think of you or how they perceive you. Because mm -hmm. you have a perception of yourself, which you think you're projecting out into the world. And if people tell you like, hey, this is how I see you, and there's a disconnect, there's something either in your own communication which you're missing or something else is going on versus this is what I want to project in the world and the people, and they tell you, hey, this is what I see and it's perfectly aligned, then you know it's working. Like, oh, okay, then I'm being true to myself. So it's a good way to test your own perception mm -hmm. of yourself and how others see you. But you know you don't necessarily have to care about what strangers see you, but it is nice to get a couple strangers' point of view because it's so non-objective. They don't know you. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they can only give you a first impression or what I like to see uh, Malcolm Gladwell calls uh, thin slicing from his book Blink, which is a phenomenal book about intuition. Okay. Um, so it is, it's interesting. It's definitely get someone to help you it will, they will be able to ask you the hard questions you're not willing to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about the hard questions. Let's say as a brand strategist, you have to ask a lot of hard questions to the your client. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it can be difficult, like they might be too closed and they might not be ready to answer that questions. So what your strategy to asking that hard questions? Like we'll need these answers. <sighs> Um, well, I mean, I don't per se have a strategy for asking questions. Uh, hmm. Or is it in the questions, like how you frame it? To pull okay, out yeah, the that right. I can, I can play with. Um, definitely make the questions open-ended. Never mm -hmm. ask a question that, that can be answered yes or no. Always make the question personal to that person mm -hmm. that forces them to reflect and think about what they're going to say. Not like, hey, are you hungry today? Yes, I'm hungry. Okay, yeah. now what? Or instead of asking, are you hungry? Hey, um, what kind of food do you like to eat? Or what cuisine do you enjoy most? Now they can sit there and think, ah, you know what? 
um, I really love Japanese cuisine because of the fresh fish and blah, 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 blah. It makes them think more critically and give you a more in-depth answer versus yes and no. So always ask open-ended questions because you want people to dig deep to understand. And the heart of the question, especially emotionally triggered ones, make sure you give the person time to think and breathe. If there's long periods of awkward silence, just revel in it. Don't try to fill the silence. Let them sit there and think. Granted, if it's like three, four minutes, it's like, hey, is okay? Is everything all right, you know? But you know, if it's like 10, 30, 40 seconds, it's okay. Um, in regards to questions, phenomenal book, The Coaching Habit by Michael, Bung- Michael Bungay Steiner. Mm-hmm. It's just a book of seven questions. I use those questions in my discovery calls and they tend to reveal a whole lot and they are open-ended questions and they're so simple and you can even use it on yourself as Mm -hmm. long as you're being true in your answers yeah that's something interesting because i have faced that the awkward silences let's say (laughs) I, i ask a question and there's a long pause and they are thinking they are going back in their mind mm-hmm. and they pull out sometimes they pull out the story you are not expecting yeah like, and those are the gems those are the yeah. best and you feel like i got you <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you have sent me the gold nugget this is what i was waiting for so i don't know who was saying that but uh, most of their clients uh, after the strategy session are teary like yeah. they feel like it's been a, so is there an interesting story which has happened with you because I've never made a client cry yet. So is there any <laughs> emotional story? Uh, yeah, I've got a, quite a few. I made quite a few clients <laughs> cry. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not cry in a bad way. Yeah. Um, it, it's the first time it happened. It was, I felt kind of terrible because I didn't intend them to cry. Mm-hmm. It, we were digging into values and I had an aha moment myself because I learned something new and just the sheer power of a story. So one of my exercises I do for purpose, I have people write their own eulogy or obituary. So pretend it's a hundred years and they're dead. And what achievements do you want, right? And at the end of my brand strategy, I, I end on values and we extract values out of the story they did in the beginning. And I we review it and I highlight key values. And then, okay, there's a value I found. Tell me a story about this specific value. Why is this important to you? And they'll sit there and they'll dig back and there's these deep seated emotional stories. And when they start telling them one after the other, they become overwhelmed with emotion. And because they're so deeply connected to these stories that experiences in their lives, they get teary eyed yeah. and it translates. I start getting teary. I'm like, okay, and just try to hold those tears in because <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's, it's fascinating because Brand strategy, whether you're doing a personal personal branding, I like a lot more than organizational branding because organizational branding, you don't get those deep emotions as much because you're dealing mm-hmm. with a group of people or you're just dealing with a founder and why they started a company versus a personal brand where you're getting deep into their life. And when you're diving into these past emotional moments, emotions tend to physically manifest, usually through tears. It yeah. not, might not necessarily be sadness. It could be mixed emotions of sadness and joy and fear and other things because you're tapping in to maybe a story they forgot about or haven't talked about in a long time or maybe never even verbally expressed it to anyone else therefore they're giving you these very open vulnerable moments to someone they don't necessarily know that well but and they're even paying you which is even weirder right you have this role of almost being a therapist at times Mm -hmm. especially when you're deeping into the internal brand because you're tapping into their past. Yeah. And it's, there's a, uh, I don't want to say it's funny, but within my, my icon of my logo, it's an R and a C, but the C is kind of cut and looks like a teardrop. Mm-hmm. And now I use it as a story like, Hey, yeah, I has a teardrop there because I make people cry during my <laughs> sessions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really important to connect emotionally with your client. Mm-hmm. And when you and, are like you, just like a therapist, you make them vulnerable. So that should be, I think, to figure out the deep truth, you have to dig deeper and find out what their main story is. Because there's a story which they tell to everyone and there's a deep cause within them which rarely comes out through 
brand and for this the brand strategy and paired it with the content strategy that's really like, necessary it, exactly exactly i was going to say like these people if you are able to get that deep with your client they end up having these catharsis moments where they are now healed to some degree and if it was a traumatic experience or just a, a really fond memory they haven't expressed in a while it revitalizes them and kind of gives them a newfound passion as well and they also become excited about their brand at that point because now to them it has a deeper meaning and they're able to express it and communicate it better to their audience because now they're more in tune and aware of what it means to them yeah yeah that definitely a deep stuff and uh, sometimes let's say i'm a new strategist so sometimes mm -hmm. i'm not prepared for that emotional stuff that's coming out <laughs> and sometimes i'm barely able to hold myself because i don't know how to respond to this so is there any way to like f channel this through and uh, what's your like approach on that um, yeah, I mean, the first time it happened to me, I wasn't prepared for it at all. Uh, I didn't expect that to happen. And to be honest, I didn't know that was something that would happen in a brand strategy. Therefore, I was completely unprepared and caught off guard myself. Now that I've gone through it several times, what I can say is be empathic, right? really listen, not just attentively listen to every word they're saying, but also listen to the underlying emotions that are not being said and give the people space to express those emotions. Cause that's what it's really about. It's not just the stories themselves, it's the feelings underneath it that are not being spoken, but are being expressed and either their mannerisms or their tone of voice. And when you are there, you must be able to read those on the subconscious level and take it in, accept it, mm -hmm. and thank them for expressing those feelings. And make sure you also acknowledge the feelings that they're expressing to you so you validate them, which gives them, it empowers them to open up even more because they're giving you very vulnerable moments and you are there to receive it, accept it, thank them, and recognize and affirm them so they continue. I, I had no idea it was going to be like that. I was told, yeah, you know, it can get emotional. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Then it happened. You're just yeah. like, oh my God, what do I do? You kind of freeze up because, it's happening. yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's happening. Oh my God. It's like, it, it's as if like a best friend came to you with a very deep seated problem and they're just sobbing and crying and you're sitting there like, oh my God, what do I do? You just kind of give them a hug and pat their back, but you're just kind of frozen. You don't know what to do. And most of the time you just got to be there and be that shoulder for them to lean on and accept it and just do what you can to comfort them, acknowledge them so they continue because you really want them to dump all that out so you can document it because that's what's going to be the foundation of their brand. Yeah. It's just like therapy. I, I go back to this line <laughs> that we are a therapist. If you recognize that as a therapist or not, but we are a therapist. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it really is. And unfortunately, I don't think it is... Um, taught that way when you learn brand strategy we're mostly taught like frameworks and strategies yeah. and this and that but a lot of it is emotion and if you are not an empathic person or have empathic listening skills or know how to accept emotions that is a huge part of it and is a psychological aspect because we're dealing with people's minds and emotions and connecting the two therefore there's a has to be a level or fundamental understanding of how they connect and work and i didn't get that until much later luckily my training tapped into that a bit so mm -hmm. i had a fundamental understanding but not like a true true deep understanding um not like a psycholo not like a psychology degree or anything like that but at least service level basic 101 psychology and emotions will go a long way in brand strategy for sure yeah that's really Important. And what do you think is missing from a lot of new strategies? I, I hope you have worked with a lot of strategy, new strategies and you treat these them strategy. So what do you think that they miss when starting out? Uh, the, the, to me, this is easy because uh, I was in the same boat uh -huh. when I started learning strategy. Everyone tends to learn from the same or similar sources, whether it's a course or a book, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much 
how most people are going to learn strategy, yeah. but no one has a way to apply it. And most people are too scared to do their first strategy for a client, even if it's for a friend or something. But ultimately, you got to do it to start diet. Once you learn whatever you're learning, apply it as soon as possible. So if you learn a new exercise or learn some sort of framework, apply it the next day. Just, just get out there and do it as fast as possible. That's what I did when I first started learning. I, I did immediately, a week later after I started learning, I formed a study group and then every week we'd meet and we would just all share what we learned and, and apply it in a group setting. It was a safe environment. It was great to make mistakes because it was a learning experience. So it was okay mm -hmm. to fail and it wasn't like a high risk situation. Therefore, practice, practice, practice. You have to practice it. If you don't apply it, it's just theory and knowledge and you don't use it, you're going to lose it. Therefore, the more you apply it, the deeper it sinks and the more you do it over and over and over again, the deeper that groove's going to get in your brain. And in addition, you're going to see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And you'll be able to adapt because I think most strategists get hung up on frameworks like, oh, yeah. I got to go from A, B, C, D, E, and that's the way it's going to be forever. And you know, it just depends who you learn from because every strategy is going to have their own mm -hmm. framework. Granted, there's certain elements that are always there like purpose and vision and mission and values but the exercises to extract that information might switch order or might be different exercises therefore to understand the fundamental principles underneath it all is critical and how you apply it is experimental yeah definitely i make i've been making a lot of these mistakes like the framework one mm -hmm. for me uh, like it gets like I feel like I have to fill this question out and I have so many columns to fill. Can yep. you speak really fast? So that's my strategy. Can you, yeah, 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 yeah it was emotional, but can you ask, answer my next question? So <laughs> that's I have to yeah. avoid. <laughs> so, I, I yeah. was in the same trap, like, oh my God, I got 50 questions to get through. Come on, ready to go. Bah, 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 bah. And you know what? That's not, it's, that's definitely a beginner mistake, but you don't know um, in the beginning. You just really don't because you're so focused on the framework and trying to get it right. And to be honest, there is no right way. It, mm -hmm. It's really just, as we mentioned before, it's a lot like therapy. Take your time, get deep with people, because ultimately it's not so much the questions that get answered as it is the stories they're going to tell you. Because everything you need to know about them is in stories. Really, the questions are more just triggers to get the story out of them. Yeah. Interesting. Definitely. And uh, after the strategy, you feel like you have been through their autobiography. You have figured out their, like what they are about. And I think as a, con like I'm also a brand identity designer. So when I do the strategy, I think I feel like I know them better and I can design for them better. This is so, true. Yeah, definitely. So how do you connect, like, uh, let's say you create a strategy document. How do you transfer these values to a new creator? Let's say you bring on board. Okay, so if I understand you, how do I translate the strategy into like a creative brief mm -hmm. for the designer? Well, um, there's several ways to do it. What I will lean on the most is what sometimes people call brand attributes because those I think translate the most into visuals and not just visuals, but even uh, auditory, I guess you would say, audio sounds, things like mm -hmm. that. But that's gonna cover specifically look and feel and the vibe of it all. Also really understanding the archetype that fits their brand because the archetype will be the foundation of the behaviors, of the vibe, the look, everything visual and expressive wise because it's the personality of mm -hmm. it all. And because it's an archetype, it is a universal personality throughout all cultures and you can get granular with them and you can uh, combine them to get more I guess variations so those will be the first step and then making sure you have I have predefined I guess mood boards for every specific archetype that will kind of give you a generic uh, look and feel for a specific personality mm -hmm. that kind of helps the designer on, on choosing I guess styles, but not necessarily following specifically, but at least gives them a visual direction. Uh, in addition, I will give them the story, like the uh, fundamental brand story or discovery story of why they started this, this direction. 
Um, and I do give them the values. I will give them ideally the mission statement, purpose statement, vision statement. Specifically, vision statements are really good because vision is very visual, so it allows you to see mm-hmm. more so than purpose. And depending on whether or not I'm doing the copywriting, mm-hmm. I find the messaging is critical if uh, you're going to a designer because the whole story is there and the core messaging is there. You're expressing everything already in words. And when you hand it out to the designer, they can just read it and they'll be able to imagine it in their mind already. Yeah. If you're not doing the core messaging, it's a little more abstract and the designer has to translate from just snippets versus having a whole story already laid out. I'm not much of a copywriter, even though I'm working on my copywriting skills and I find storytelling and writing the fundamentals of all creativity. It's a very hard skill to develop. Um, therefore, I usually hire a copywriter. Mm-hmm. And once that's all written out, I find the transition very easy. I find a lot of, excuse me, <clears throat> a lot of strategists and designers don't have writing skills or storytelling skills. Therefore, they kind of skip that point and there's a lot of ambiguity in between the strategy and the design. And there's a lot of interpretation that they have to take. When you have that story, which is the, the bridge in between the two, the story lays everything out and there it has the words already there that are specific to the brand, where that will trigger certain images or sounds in your mind that you can then easily translate into a design. Mm-hmm. And once the designer has it, I usually have them develop a mood board first and then from those mood boards, I'll select certain elements and have them escalate that to a stylescape. And the stylescapes should capture the essence of a brand. And usually you can do at least three anyways. Yeah. But that that transition from strategy to brief, I find that the story and the core messaging is the bridge that really lays it out. I think is more important than the brief itself because it's already taking all the elements of the strategy and expressing it in a story form which is much easier to translate than just looking at an abstract brief. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if you are aligned with the story, then it's easy to design for someone. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Also, I forgot to mention, there's also the element of the audience mm-hmm. because you're not just designing for the brand, you're also designing the brand and the audience to be able to connect. So there's yeah. two sides to it because you have to represent the brand and it has to connect with the audience. Because it can be all brand. I see this a lot with logos. Like all you're doing is dealing with the founder and the owners of the brand. Oh, this is amazing. I want this. I want that. I want this. I want this. And this looks cool. Great. And the audience sees it and they're like, what is that? I don't get it. And they go away. So there has to have that audience connection. So they have to be able to understand it. And it still has to look good for the owner. That's why I believe in questioning. Mm -hmm. I I don't want to say challenging, but you can push back a bit on the brand owner as to like, I really want this. And you can ask him, well, is this going to help you attract your clients or is your audience going to understand this? And they sit there and think, you know, like, you know what? No, they're not going to understand it. So let's get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, even though you own the logo, the logo is not for you. It's for the audience because it's an expression and they have to be able to consume it and understand it. Definitely. It's necessary for audience to understand your values. And exactly. Let's say there's a debate between going on with the strategist. So some starts with the user journey first and then moves to the mission and vision and values. And some mm-hmm. strategists start with the company's purpose, mission, values and values, and then they mm-hmm. drive into user strategy. So what's the, like uh, in this approach, is there any difference or they are going to the same path? Okay. Um, so if I understand you, do you start internally, then go external or start uh-huh. externally, then go internal? Yeah. I've had this debate many times with many people <laughs> and I will give you what I believe works best for me. Mm-hmm. I find, cause I've done both approaches. What I found is when I'm working with a personal brand, basically an individual starting internal, internally first, then work your way external, yeah. I believe works best because you're working with an individual and you want them to look inside themselves and express themselves first before you go out to the world and understand what the market wants. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with an organization, I believe working externally first works better 
because as an organization, it's not an individual, it's a collective of people, and they might not know who they are yet as an organization. Therefore, I will look to the market, specifically the customers first, and figure out what the customers want and what their pain points need and make it focused on them. And then from there, look at the competitors. So I do all the positioning first, understanding the problems, and then see if there's a solution match to their offer. And then from there, I will mold the company personality to match the customer without compromising the inner purpose and values of the company themselves, if they even have it. If not, we will mm-hmm. develop it together. So yeah. that's the way I approach. I've seen people do external first on personal brands too and vice versa. I don't think there's a right or a wrong way as long as you get to the end. There might be some nuances in the solution at the end, but ultimately I don't think one's right or wrong over the other. I just know what I found works best for me. Definitely. I completely agree with you. And that's my belief also that if you are working with the personal brand, then you have to have that essence of authenticity and you cannot pull that out without going internal first. But exactly. with, the, with a big brand, you are there to serve your audience. You are to, there to serve your tribe. So you will have to position according to that. So I completely agree with you on that. Yeah. 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 And I'll give a caveat with the personal. If you go external first and mm-hmm. focus on an audience or your ideal client, you run the risk of being inauthentic because now you're bending your personality and everything, your perspective to match them. And then it might not be true to who you are. That's yeah. why with personal, I go internal first and really understand who you are first. And then you put that in the world and people will resonate. Organization, since there's multiple people, it's much easier to mold a personality because it's not one person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, with the personal brand, authenticity is a big factor. But how mm-hmm. important do you think authenticity is in the, with the big brand? Are you there to just serve? Or like, let's say I give an order to a restaurant and they, feel they give me my order back. That's my transaction. Is it necessary for me to emotionally involve with them? What do you think about that? Let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. Which brand do you resonate more with? Lenovo or Apple? Definitely Apple. Why is that? I think the answer is obvious with the Steve Jobs and the story and everything around it. There you go. So personality matters because you have an emotional connection to Apple. It might be through Steve Jobs, but mm-hmm. he was able to communicate his vision, his values, what things meant to him. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. I want to be a part of that. What does Lenovo talk about? The tech specs on the phone. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I don't know anything about Lenovo other than that their computers are cheap. They have decent specs. But from my experience buying Lenovo's, they're not very reliable. Mm -hmm. So it's I'm comparing, I guess, a commodity to a story Mm -hmm. and an emotional connection. That's the difference. That's what branding does for you. Yeah. Vice versa. Like what's like how which one do you like more? If I told you to choose, um, thinking, I'm thinking, what's that company name? Like, say, uh, Mizuno versus Nike. I never heard about Mizuno, so I heard okay. only about Nike. <laughs> I'm trying to pick an abstract uh, shoe brand. Uh-huh. Uh, even like, how about Under Armour? Are you familiar with Under Armour? Yeah. So, Under Armour or Nike? I think Under Armour. Oh, interesting. How come Under Armour? I think because I have seen a lot in, in, on the Zoro one and the work with him. So for me. Interesting. I, I was going to assume you're going to choose Nike because they're a stronger brand. But nonetheless, you have something that you connect to. That's the whole point of a brand. It's all about that emotional connection because you're telling a story and people are able to see a personality in the brand that reflects who they are. Therefore, it's a part of their own identity because they feel a part of that tribe. Mm-hmm. And let's talk about the content because as a content strategist, what do you think is the best medium to convey your authenticity, your values, your vibe? Is it post or is it the video? Since I've I, seen I'm, the- I'm biased on this one because I come from a video background, so I'm going to uh-huh. say video. <laughs> to me, video is the ultimate medium because it's audio, it's video, and you can see my facial expressions, which you're not going to yeah. get 
and Definitely. writing, although I do appreciate writing, but I find a lot of nuances get lost and it's much harder to convey tone and it's much easier to miscommunicate. I do appreciate audio and social audio because you can still get the nuances in my voice, but you're losing mm -hmm. the facial expressions. And the way humans, from my understanding, uh, from, from listening and studying neuroscience, the way humans connect, connect and communicate is primarily body language. Yeah. Through gestures, hands, facial expressions, and you're losing that in all mediums with the exception of video. And you even lose pieces of it in video because video is not in real life. I mean, we're not face to face in person, so you don't see the mm -hmm. whole space around me and aspects, but you can get a good reference of how I look, like my eyes are closed, you know, my, my mannerisms, my gestures. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of body language, unspoken language. I believe it's called NLP, Neuro Linguistic yeah. Programming. That is a huge part of it. And this is why I like video because you will see new content creators on video. They're like frozen and stiff because they're me. so <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah. And it, it just, you're just like, whoa, what's going on here, right? And that's mm -hmm. not you yet, you know, because you're, you're getting used to this new medium that you are not comfortable with. But as you get loose, you kind of hang out and you're like, and your real self comes out. You're like, hey, how's it going? No, I'm on kit, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh, that guy's cool. I'm gonna watch him some more. Yeah. It allows your personality to shine more, but it definitely takes time to get over that fear of being in front of a camera. Believe me, mm -hmm. I was the same way because I was so used to being behind a camera for many years. The first mm -hmm. time I was in camera, I was like, uh, yeah, um, hi, I'm Richard. This is, you're freaking out because you're talking to this lens that like there's no one else here. It just feels so awkward. Definitely. And I completely like uh, with the NLP and stuff, that's something really different. I've been trying to figure out more like what makes a person interesting or what makes a story interesting mm -hmm. and why I'm addicted to the story or why I'm addicted to the song. So mm. there's some element of that NLP and stuff. And I was having this discussion with my client who is in the psychology background mm -hmm. and he recommended me, you should definitely check this out because it's, it's going to be a big part of your strategy. Interesting. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, definitely. So do you think that uh, someone m might say that I'm reading this book called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Mm -hmm. And it includes a lot of techniques like what they call psychological tricks. Mm -hmm. So how do you think, uh, let's suppose I'm, I'm suggesting someone that these are the best strategies to put your content out and to be more relatable. So how genuine do you feel that this using these tricks could be? Or so you should just go on the camera and uh, be your best self or should you use these tactics to convert you convert like on the getting on the metric conversion mode? So how mm -hmm. important do you think that, uh, and what's the, what they call it morality of this tactics? Are? All right. I'll, I'll do my best to answer this. I will say I have not read the book Split mm -hmm. the difference by Chris Voss. I am aware of the book and some of the techniques. Um, there's another book that I can compliment that one. It's called, uh, Oh God. Um, contagious. Yeah. Hmm. Oh God. What's the author's name? Um, Jonah Berger. Uh, oh, think yeah, Jonah. Berger. That it's I very similar. Mm -hmm. It's a book about persuasion. No, not contagious. Um. Ah, oh, God. The author's Jonah Berger. He wrote the book Contagious, but he has a newer book that also mm -hmm. talks about persuasion and the psychology of people purchasing stuff. I can't remember the name of it right now. It's a yellow cover with like a butterfly on it. I think I'll, I'll get back to you on it. Great book. Okay. I read mm -hmm. that one. I can understand the techniques in that. I think it's very similar to Chris Voss because he does um, mention him and reference Chris, mm -hmm. Chris Voss and some of the techniques. Therefore, what I would say in the very beginning, don't get hung up on these techniques. They're, they're kind of advanced. These people are experts who've yeah. been doing this for years and have mastered these techniques. I'm sure in the beginning, they didn't have them either. If you're just starting out, it's nice to read it and be aware. Mm -hmm. Maybe try one couple times to get the hang of it. But in the beginning, I would say what's more important is just getting comfortable in your own skin in front of a camera if you're doing video, getting comfortable writing if you're doing blogs and articles, get comfortable talking and speaking in public if you're on social audio. Yeah, It's all about getting comfortable first. Once you're comfortable and you relax and you can be yourself, then you can start applying these techniques. Because if you start applying techniques in the beginning, and you're not comfortable yet, it's going to feel very fake and yeah. you're trying too hard. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. because you are because you're like oh i gotta do this technique but i'm not comfortable and you start stressing out and it, and it translates yeah therefore just get comfortable first do some content just being whatever medium you choose get through at least 10 15 of them loosen up it's a lot like exercise you know mm -hmm. if you're hitting the gym you haven't been in the gym in years the first day is going to be rough the yeah. second day is going to be rough after two weeks you're like okay i got the hang of this now okay now now let's go lift some weights now or something take it up the next notch mm -hmm. i would say have those techniques in mind yeah. i wouldn't apply them right away unless you're already comfortable with whatever if you're already comfortable with mm -hmm. whatever medium that you choose yeah yeah interesting take and yeah if you are like uh, and there's a debate on like faking it till making or being authentic so these are the two sides like yeah yeah um i mean there's certain things you can fake till you make uh -huh. but at the same time there has to be a level of confidence <laughs> in order to fake it because mm -hmm. if you're not confident you're faking it people will pick up on it real fast and be like ah oh, this dude's full of crap mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you definitely have to have a level of like yeah i got this like you gotta psych yourself up like yeah i'm gonna do this you know i don't know it but i'm gonna be confident and i'm gonna do it and if i fail it's okay and i think that's the main part of it is not so much the confidence i guess as it is the fear of conquering the fear first because the fear is where the insecurity comes from and the lack of confidence comes from. You gotta be able to just like, you know, accept it, let it go over you, like, okay, it's all right if I fail and just accept it, you know, this is the first time I'm gonna do this. I know it's not gonna be great, but I'm gonna do it anyways, and I'm gonna get better every time. Yeah, it's just like getting your first drafts out there. Yeah, so yeah definitely. it's what it is. Okay, so Richard, it's been a wonderful conversation. I know you have to go. And if you please let us know, like, where we can find you on your social or your website. Absolutely. We so, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Why don't you go ahead and do that again? <laughs> no worries, no worries. Please, please. Go ahead. I was going to say, you can find me on Instagram at Richard Sellis 3 because I am the third. Um, <laughs> you can also find me on Instagram. I'm sorry. You can find me on LinkedIn as Richard Sellis III, I, as like a Roman numeral three. Mm -hmm. And you can find me on Twitter. Everything's pretty much my name, Richard Sellis. In addition, I have a community called the Crea Sphere on Circle. So it could be creasphere.circle.so. And if you send me a DM, if you guys want to have a chat sometime. Definitely. And if you want, all the links are will be in the description. So please make sure to check out. He's an amazing guy. And Richard. It's been a wonderful conversation. Yes, it has. Thank you very much for uh, having me. I'm looking Thank forward you for to joining. Final product. Awesome, Ankit. <laughs>